um, we're going to start with uh, the series of events that got us here in this uh, blockchain space. So in 2009, we had the Bitcoin Genesis, which was the first blockchain invented and implemented. Uh, two years later, a lot of uh, altcoins or colored coins, uh, depends how you were the name, started to show up like Maincoin or Litecoin. Um, and um, this uh, thing about uh, exchanging uh, cryptocurrency between uh, blockchains is the problem of interoperability. And the first idea and space that came was uh, on a forum, on a post on Bitcoin Talk. Uh, from Pierre Nola, which described the uh, uh, type of interoperability, which is called the atomic swap. And uh, we're going to see in the next slide what that is. Uh, in 2015, we had uh, the apparition of the Ethereum, uh, Ethereum virtual machine, which uh, allowed us to have DeFi, smart contracts, <coughs> a lot of interactions in the space. Um, two years later, ICO boom and the popularization of ERC20 standards, where I think anyone knows about them and uh, uses them. And uh, with the, this, also uh, the addition of Uniswap automatic market making in 2018 uh, allowed us to exchange uh, tokens on a chain. Well, we wouldn't need a centralized exchange anymore. I mean, uh, anyone uses them, but you could also do that on chain. Uh, and it's automatically. Um, also, uh, in this year, the paper, the research for uh, elliptical digital signature uh, algorithm, threshold signature scheme, uh, was published, and uh, it allowed anyone in the space, uh, if they want, uh, it allowed them to implement more complex protocol that would allow uh, the distribution and uh, the signing in a distributed matter. And we can see that three years later, Torchain actually implemented it uh, along with the network that uh, uh, we're going to see that you could swap tokens, you could bridge them. And also in uh, 2021, the tablet upgrade on Bitcoin, which also implemented smart signatures, uh, which are uh, which are a lightweight, uh, let's say, version of elliptical digital signature. They are they are on the same curve, which is uh, SECP two hundred and fifty six K one, um, and it it's linear, meaning that uh, in order to have multi signatures, you can just add the signatures together, and also to verify, you add the public keys, uh, it will result a new public key, and you can verify. Uh, and basically, at a theoretical uh, level, uh, this problem of interoper interoperability of exchanging crypto from one chain to another uh, goes to a fair exchange problem, which means that um, in order for an exchange to be fair, both parties need to receive what they want or neither of them do. And uh, in practice, there is a known result by uh, Henning Pania and Felix Garner, which shows that... Uh, this fair exchange cannot be resolved uh, without um, uh, without uh, a trusted third party. It's impossible. So in order to do that, you need to rely, you need to trust on someone. And uh, we're going to see that in the two types of interoperability, which are atomic swaps and uh, bridges, uh, in the case of atomic swaps, the trusted third, third party is the blockchain consensus. And we're going to see why. And uh, in the case of bridges, is actually the participating is the guardian node, the observers of the events that actually sign the transactions to release the funds on each uh, on each uh, network. And we're gonna see how. Uh, so first, uh, let's talk about the atomic swaps. The first step uh, and the most trivial one is the hash time lock contract, uh, which basically says that if Alice and Bob wants to exchange coins, um, let's say Bob is going to initiate the, the, the trade, he's going to come up with a secret, he's going to hash it, and he's going to put it in a script or contract which says, hey, whoever comes with the pre-image of this hash can unlock the funds. Only Bob knows it now. And Alice is going to copy that hash, she's going to put it in uh, her contract which blocks her funds, uh, which says, hey, whoever comes with the pre-image can unlock my funds. And Bob, because he knows the pre-image, is going to use it to unlock Alice's funds. 
Alice is gonna see it, and she's gonna use the same uh, pre-image to unlock Bob's uh, uh, funds, and so they're gonna uh, they're gonna exchange. And uh, here we trust the protocol consensus that is gonna not gonna revert the blocks or something. Uh, this um, uh, 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 HTL, uh, HTLC uh, doesn't provide um, um, uh, privacy because anyone can see the hashes on the blockchain because it's public and they can actually link the transactions together and they can see that Alice and Bob actually exchange one Bitcoin for ten light ones or something like that. And uh, with the implementation of Taproot and uh, Schnorr signatures on Bitcoin uh, can allow for now the implementation of points time lock contract and um, the time lock uh, in this context means that uh, if um, someone doesn't come with a solution to my hash or to my challenge, then I can get a refund. I can get my funds back. And uh, this point time lock contract, I'm going to reduce the cryptography behind so it's much easier. Basically, what it does, if Alice initiates the, um, the trade, She's going to sign the release of the funds, but she's going to tweak her signature. And by that, because North signatures are linear, you can just add a number to your signature. And uh, if you want, uh, you're going to add the number. Uh, you're going to, Bob is going to complete the signature. We're going to do it also for Alice funds, also for Bob's hand uh, uh, funds. And when Alice is going to want to get the funds from Bob, she's going to come with that uh with the minus t with the minus number that she just added to her signature you know and bob is gonna see that he's also gonna use it to come to get the signature the correct signature and release alice's funds and uh, these are also used as payment channels for lightning network right now i mean right now it's implemented the first version hash time lock contract and uh, i think they're trying to implement the better version um the next type of interoperability comes from bridges, which are a bigger, a much bigger thing. And uh, the first design that we know is in 2018, wrapped, bet wrapped BTC that was implemented by Bitco. It's actually a centralized bridge. They have a smart contract on Ethereum. And uh, in order to initiate a swap, someone has to come and say, hey, I want to transfer my Bitcoins uh, and I want to receive them on this address. And uh, the next step is going to be you transfer Bitcoin to their address, to BitGo. They're going to wait for confirmation. They, they are just going to wrap the Bitcoins and send it to you on Ethereum. And uh, if you want to go backwards, you just burn them and specify the return address. Uh, the next uh, step, uh, the next natural step in this was a more decentralized architecture because uh, with in this space we don't want to trust uh, a person or we want to decentralize the trust as much as possible and uh, we, I, we have some examples of bridges like wormhole uh, which basically imagine this you have two networks network a and network b and we have another networks of observers validators guardians wardens doesn't matter that they see events on each network events that lock or unlock coins and let's say someone locks uh coins here on this network they, they observe the the locking they wait for confirmation and they're going to sign the transaction to release funds or meet them on the other network that's how bridges work and those nighting guardians actually in order to release some funds they require 13 out of 19 uh signatures they use schnorr signature they aggregate the aggregator as i was saying uh, and uh, if 13 of them sign a transaction, then the fund will be released on the destination network. Uh, the next example, uh, which actually um, uh, doesn't hold the private key, because every of those guardians need to have the private key on their virtual private server, but right here, the uh, Avalanche is using Intel Software Guard um, extension, SGX, which is basically a software enclave that um, in a section of RAM, it has uh, encrypted, uh, it, it is encrypted, the RAM is encrypted, meaning that no one can read and it's, all, uh, it's uh, decrypted only in the processor. So uh, it, you could say that it's uh, safe. I mean, um, 
uh, you don't basically have the private key because no one can read it unless uh, there is a bug or something. And um, when the, for the N Club first ran, uh, they had a master key which um, derived the private key that was distributed to all those wardens using Shamir secret share and they all got a share. So they basically don't have the private key. They just have a share, they can sign with it. And when they combine, that's because the private key is combined in the end club, that's how you verify the signature uh, to produce the final one. Uh, and uh, they're gonna send the transaction. And the next level uh, of blockchain of bridges are Tor chain and multi chain, which are relying on threshold signature scheme. Which, uh, as I was saying earlier, you generate, you sign in a distributed manner. And what is uh, really cool about this, and you don't know, you no longer need an enclave, is that when the signature, the final signature is produced, the private key is not recreated. So you, uh, one attacker that would listen when the signature is created, or that would uh, watch the RAM, would look over, uh, read the RAM, they wouldn't be able to create the private key. So it's secure from this point, and you don't need an enclave on encrypted RAM. Uh, also, moreover, Torchain and Multichain, they have a network that is dedicated towards this, and uh, you, they have vaults, you can swap, you can trade, to not only wrap, tokens i mean btc for wrap btc you can also instantly you have btc you're gonna trade it for wrap ethereum it's uh, really complex what they have and also the peer-to-peer -peer network really cool uh okay so if we're gonna abstract this problem as i was saying so we have two networks and on each network um when we make a transaction you need to be able to put some data in that transaction even on bitcoin uh, you can use the no open a no operation um, um, instruction on the stack and you can put some data um, after that uh, on ethereum you can specify it in the data field that when you call a, a smart contract because you need to be able to specify when you do a trade when you do a bridge and you are going to bridge a coin you need to specify the destination address that you want to receive or where you want to receive the funds on the other network and uh, of course, the, the, um, you also need the amount and the, the token that you're going to want to bridge. On Bitcoin, it's obvious. I mean, if you can buy Bitcoin, then you take the amount from the block and you know it's Bitcoin. But on Ethereum, for example, if you want to swap on uh, ERC20, then you need to specify and also the amount. I mean, you also going to send them, but you need to specify them. Uh, the next thing is, so between these two networks, we have that node of that network of observers observers that need to uh, listen on these events they must wait for confirmations because otherwise if an event is not uh, confirmed the bridge is rolled back you're gonna lose some funds as a bridge and it's not a uh, it's not a good architecture mm. the next thing is uh, actually how this uh, because um, it is how they keep the private key that has access to unlocking the, the, the tokens. And uh, we have seen that uh, how some bridges uh, create the private key and distribute it, or they use just a multi-sig and uh, you just allow some public keys to come up with signatures and they have rights to, to unlock funds or mint or burn. And uh, the last thing is mint or burn the list or lock mechanisms. Because uh, let's take a look of uh, this example. I mean, on the source network, let's imagine on uh, on Ethereum, you have uh, Ethereum, which is, uh, or wrapped Ethereum, let's say, let's uh, use uh, ERC20. You have wrapped Ethereum, uh, which originates from that network. But if you want to bridge it on Solana, you're going to do a wrapping of that. You don't own that. It doesn't exist there. It's just wrap version. And, um, you need on the destination network you need to have rights to burn and mint that token because when any when everyone stops uh wrapped ethereum on the destination network it's gonna be minted. minted but when it goes back it needs to be burned because it doesn't exist here and on the source network you just lock and release the funds you don't have rights on it you can't do anything and that's how this works you know, you need to have on the destination network like a mechanism and ownership of the token to wrap and 
to burn in uh, mint it. And um, uh, some final thoughts. Uh, there is actually a current problem in the, the space of bridges, and uh, it was described by Vitalik Buterin uh, in a Reddit post, which said that um, imagine uh, this scenario. Uh, you have, uh, okay, you have, uh, doesn't matter, uh, Ethereum and Solana, you bridge 10 Ethereum to Solana, okay? Uh, you lock the funds, they are confirmed, the observer see it, wait for the they wait for the confirmation, they sign it, they release the funds. And uh, after you receive your uh, 10 wrapped Ethereum on Solana, someone attacks the Ethereum network with a 50% uh, plus one attack, and they actually roll back some transaction. You know, they, they change the transaction. And what is going to happen uh, is that you have no longer, uh, you have no longer sent the 10 Ethereum to the bridge address. They no longer have it, but you have the 10 wrapped Ethereum on Solana. You still have them. So now the bridge, the bridge is missing 10, 10 Ethereums. They don't have it anymore. It's not pegged. I mean, of course, you, you just gain money using this attack. And uh, what he was saying uh, in this Reddit post here is that uh, this risk uh, actually grows with the amount of tokens that you're trying to bridge. Because, of course, for 10 Ethereum, no one is going to attack the Ethereum network or another network that requires less proof of stake. But let's say with hundreds of millions in a swap or something, it could be viable for someone to do that because they're, they're going to earn money. And this is the problem with cross chains, you know, cross chains that don't rely on the same protocol. And what he was saying, uh, but it's not uh, a solution, but he was describing the layer two networks on each uh, because uh, a blockchain is actually a layer one network that has its own consensus protocol and if you have if you build a layer two that is relying on the layer one consensus that then each time the layer one is rolled back then also the layer, the layer two is going to roll back so it is resilient to this uh, type of attack so so that would be the only bridge that it's safe uh from this attack and uh as a future work in this field i expect to see some um, uh, the use of uh, hardware security module to store the key shard uh, which is basically a hardware thing that can sign can send transaction can store uh, encrypted you can store your key encrypted and uh, also post quantum thresh threshold schemes uh, i mean yeah right now we're I don't know, we have a hundred and something qubits in uh, quantum computers, but we don't know in a few years, maybe someone could discover a groundbreaking uh, thing and the number could go exponentially. And I don't know, we could lose uh, control over a discrete logarithm pro uh, problem or something. Um, and that's it. That's my uh, talk. <laughs>